G'day, I'm Sean, and welcome to the Car Expert Podcast. We're back again. We've got a very exciting week, a bit of a shorter episode this week because we've uh, got a busy, busy week on, but we've got Scott and James here. As always, how are you doing, guys? Good, thank you. How are you? Very good. I'm excited. It's Grand Prix week. Yeah, Melbourne's buzzing. It is. Weather's been beautiful. The grandstands are up. Lando Norris is in town, according to Instagram. Yes. Yeah, I drove past this morning on the way in, and uh, yeah, it's just all the taxi signs are up. Everyone's getting excited. I think the roads are all closed through there, yeah. so it's happening. Um, <laughs> but we're going to talk about Grand Prix a little bit later on, but first we're going to dive in. Uh, Volkswagen has announced the ID.3 GTX, which I know it's a mouthful. The dot is silent. The dot is silent. Um, but that's, it's basically an electric golf. It's the electric golf we've sort of all waited for, isn't it? So uh, I guess I'll open up to the floor. Who wants to tell me a bit about it? I'm going to correct you just quickly because we've had the ID3 for a little while. This is exciting because it's the GTX, which is kind of the successor to GTI. It's a new sporty brand for Volkswagen, and it's the I suppose the, the next step in what is one of motoring's most iconic sort of badges. I'm really excited by what it shows as well. So, so James, you spent a bit of time driving the Bourne, yeah. which we know shares a lot of parts with it. So I guess, what do we expect from this uh, ID3 GTX? Yeah, so the, the ID3 and the Bourne are almost the same car, like to the point where the bodies are almost identical as well. What's exciting about this new um, ID3 GTX and also the Bourne VZ that was revealed about three weeks ago is that it brings in a much more powerful motor that's in the other ID and electric products that are coming out of the Volkswagen Group. So it's got like 210 kilowatts and 545 newton meters going to the rear wheels. Really? Which is a lot for a little car. That's a lot. Yeah, and it'll still weigh about two tons, which is a lot for it's a car. It's a lot for a little time. car. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, the, the, the kind of pace that I'll be able to do, they, they should be able to do a sub six seconds, zero to 100. It's got a bigger battery in it now that allows it to do, you know, 550, 560 kilometers on WLTP testing. So when you think about, you know, for someone like myself who, you know, not that anyone knows, but I drive a Golf GTI you myself. Golf GTI? I know, it's like the worst kept secret. Wow. But Something that would be a challenge for me is that people who have cars like that perhaps love the all-in-one thing that a lot of these hot hatches have historically mm, offered, absolutely. right? They're fairly efficient, so you can drive long distances if you need to. They're well-sized, they're still fun, but you know, they're, and they're still relatively attainable. I think this next generation of stuff from the Volkswagen Group is starting to really tap into that, you know, around 60 to 65 grand, you'll be able to get a hot hatch that's electric, that can go far, and also is a practical everyday driver. So I think it, it, it's still all pap on paper stuff at the moment. We'll have to see what it's like when it comes in, but it's definitely a really positive sign to see what's coming. So that is a bit of a price jump over current guy. I mean, I know the Golf's gotten it's very expensive. It's actually not that but... much of a price jump. I mean, the current Golf GTI, once you put some options on it, is call it a $60,000 car on the road. You're paying more than 70 for a Golf R on the road now. We don't know exactly what the GTX is going to cost, but based on the Bourne, if it does land around the 60, 65 mark, there actually is big potential for it to, if not steal people away from the GTI, at least sit side by side with it. So Volkswagen can go, here's the old, here's the new, make your choice. The big thing it does that, that uh, is the departure from the Golf and the GTI is they've moved the drive from the front to the rear. Yeah. And I guess for purists, um, like James, <laughs> is that going to be a bit of a hard thing to wrap your head around? Because, I mean, that is one of the, the, the key things of a Golf GTI, right? Look, I think with the Golf GTI, sorry, I cut you off yeah. there, James. With the Golf GTI, Volkswagen has done an incredible job making it feel like the least front drive, front drive car ever. So if you think of what all the tech does, it's got torque vectoring, it's got a really clever electronic diff, it's got all sorts of clever traction control systems, and they mean that Yes, it feels front wheel drive, but it's not like it's a raucous old school torque steering front drive car. It's just a really polished car that depending on the road almost feels all wheel drive at times. So I actually don't think that they're losing too much because it's not like that car is defined by the fact it's front drive. It's defined by the fact that it is capable, comfortable and fun to drive. And switching to rear drive just brings new opportunities for character in there that may be more old school because you might get a little bit of oversteer. What about you, James, as a, as a purist? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, look, I don't really think there's that much of an issue with it. I think there was, you know, there was a time when hatchbacks were rear wheel drive and, you know, we all mourned the loss of like the BMW M140 at one mm -hmm. stage. And so I think it, people were excited when Volkswagen brought out the rear drive architecture for the ID products because, it, you know, that classic rear drive layout is something that a lot of enthusiasts and automotive purists want, whether that's a hot hatch purist is another thing but you know some of the most iconic performance hatchbacks have been rear wheel drive you look at like the the, like the one series the you know the the Clio V6 there's a lot of like other old school um, hot hatches that have been rear wheel drive and have a lot of power and that's all part of the fun so and the Bourne 
drives beautifully. So <laughs> and does with, burnouts as, as exactly. we found out. Exactly. Burnouts. Yeah. 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 So yes. with a bit more pace for both of them and maybe some more focused chassis running gear. I think there's some real potential in there. Mm. I want to pick up on something you've put in our sheet here. It uses chat GPT for the voice assistant. Yes, I find that really fascinating. And, I, and I'm curious, will it be a learning thing that it does and it learns the things that you want? Or well, I was just in France as I mentioned last week with Peugeot and that's one of the things they're doing as well. They've got chat GPT in their cars. To test it out and to mess with Paul, I actually, and I'll, I'll put the video for Sean so he can show you, tried asking chat GPT in a Peugeot 408, who is Paul Marich? And to prove this tech works, it said, I don't know. Who is Paul Marich? I'm sorry, but I do not have any information about a person named Paul Marich. Would you like me to search the internet for you? Yes, please. I apologize for the inconvenience, but as a digital assistant, I do not have direct access to the internet to perform a search. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, very accurate there. Yeah. Uh, the most important question is, will tartan seats be available for it? If it's gonna be a GTI replacement, will we be able to get tartan seats? Uh, Volkswagen, if you're watching, yeah. we need tartan seats. I think the GTX stuff uses a version, like they use the Alcantara stuff uh, that they offer elsewhere. Now, GTI is not dead, to be clear. Right. They, um, Volkswagen previewed the next generation of GTI stuff with the, um, the ID2 concept from last year's Munich Motor Show. So that will retain a front drive layer it, and it looked like a, a mean electric polo sort of thing. And I think what Volkswagen has sort of done a little bit of a 180 on from a few years ago is that instead of killing off its iconic nameplates like it once said it would to go into this new electrified age, they're actually gonna have some middle period where both the the new age ID stuff and this GTX badge things will be sold alongside the new electrified versions of their icons. So, you know, Golf, Passat, it seems like they're all actually going to stay now past 2026, which originally they weren't going to. And so I think we may see an interesting period where you can sort of have this new shape product or you know that has like the real drive layout and some of the newer things and then you have their iconic stuff that has the tartan seats that has the red pinstriping and all that kind of stuff so i think there's something to that and i think maybe in the motoring world maybe it's marketing firms justifying their salaries or maybe it's just a desire to rip up what's old and start again but people who aren't car people know cars by their names I had a Cooper born for one night when we had it through recently and dad said, what size is it? And I said, oh, well, it, it's essentially a Golf, maybe a little bit smaller. And that immediately clicked. It's the same thing when you drive an ID3 or a, an ID5, the SUV, ID4, excuse me. It's a Golf or it's a Tiguan. That's how people associate these things in their brains. And when Volkswagen said it didn't want to keep these famous names alive, it seemed like a mistake. So I'm glad that they're gonna stick with something people can grab onto and I suppose has some connection because everyone knows someone who's owned a Golf or has owned one themselves. Yeah. Well, speaking of cars that people grab onto and hold onto, <laughs> I go. want to talk about some uh, Yarra City councillors recently who think that Australians buy Hummers, um, which they don't because you can't buy a Hummer in Australia. I don't think you've been able to for 15 years. And probably. even when you could, no one bought them. <laughs> yes, so. that's true. One last mention of France. I actually saw a Hummer H3 in traffic in Paris. Oh. And it was the most out of place thing I've ever seen. I didn't get a photo, unfortunately. Arguably the most tragic thing you've ever seen as well, because <laughs> yes. they certainly were. Um, but basically the Yarra City Council want to introduce uh, a, how do, we, how do, a staged parking fee structure. It's essentially a tax it's for a, having okay. big cars. It's a ute tax. We're gonna call it, we'll a, call ute it a ute tax. because <laughs> that's clicky and catchy. Yes. <laughs> um, so a councillor called Stephen Jolly, uh, it thinks that Australians buy Hummers, and if they're buying Hummers, then they deserve to pay more for parking. Hummers and Defenders. Hummers and Defenders, big American vehicles, which, can I be clear, Mr. Jolly, the Defender is actually Indian now, so let's just get that out of the way. British. Br British Indian. Except for the fact it's made in Slovakia. Yes, okay. So anyway, not, uh, not American. And to, before we dive in, I just want to point out, I, I actually wrote down the numbers here. A Defender is 5,018 millimetres long, so just over five metres. A Toyota Kluger is 4,966 millimetres long, just under five metres. So the difference between them is fairly negligible, yet a Kluger won't be taxed, but a Defender well, will. Well, we don't actually know that, right? And this is part of the problem with what's been put forward. This idea of charging more for parking is something we've seen in Paris, and they're taxed based on weight, I believe. Right, so that makes sense. Makes sense. 
But this is sort of, the way it's been presented by Yarra Council is these cars are a scourge on our roads, we need to do something to discourage people from owning them. The policy's not been all that well laid out because we don't know whether it is weight-based, whether it's size-based, whether they'll just arbitrarily pick and go, we don't like Silverados, we like Klugers. <laughs> well, they, they don't know what cars that Australians are actually buying right. at the moment. But I think more broadly than that, it, <sighs> Paris city centre, people do live there, but it's not a car city. Well, it's a some... city that was built some hundreds of years exactly. ago with cobblestones. Right, right. so it, it's got some parking there, but it's got really good public transport. It's got all sorts of options, and there are options for people who want to park on the outskirts. If we're talking Yarra, it's kind of inner Melbourne, but it's also far enough out of the city that people might own a Ute and just because they don't drive it in the city every day doesn't mean they don't want to also take it away on the weekend with the kids, right? There are tradies who often drive in there, given Melbourne is constantly being ripped up and torn up and rebuilt, who need these vehicles for work. And I think this is my problem with the, the idea of it. It's not so much the concept of taxing vehicles differently for the amount of space they take up, it feels like a couple of councillors who should be busy looking after ratepayers and dealing with the really nitty gritty stuff of council, who've decided that it's really easy to poke fun at the big utes and are trying to cash in. So James, I'm, I'm curious, and I know you've spent a fair bit of time in Europe, you've spent a lot of time in European cities. So those cities compared to Australia, they are very, very different. But what we see over there is like congestion charges and fees like that yeah. going into like, like city centres. Mm. Is that something that they should maybe look at rather than trying to like tax based on parking spaces. Yeah, I think what this really proves is why we need a blanket system on how these things work. You know, you're speaking of these European nations and cities, they have a centralised structure, uh, you know, legislative framework that works for everybody and it, it means that everyone is treated fairly. You know, everyone has, whether it's a weight class thing, whether it's an emissions based thing, there's a consistency there that means that it doesn't mean you're just driving into some random suburb and because you're in this random suburb on this day in a certain car, they're going to slug you X amount of money. I just think that's ridiculous and that's why we need to stop having all these like little sub levels of government coming in and creating their own little rules. Instead we need a unified approach from the people or the centralised government that are making these laws. So we already saw it with the states trying to do EV levies, right? It didn't work because in Victoria, there was one rule. In Adelaide, there was another rule, and they'd still charge you when you weren't actually driving in town. So it's, it's <laughs> or in another stupid. state for that matter. Yeah, exactly right. And then yeah, they're trying to cash in on the buzzwords of the moment: Hummers. Who the hell's driven a Hummer lately? Uh, large American Utes. Chat GPT doesn't know. Sure. <laughs> yeah, large, large American Utes. That's in the news. Defenders, maybe because that's a popular thing at the moment. Mm. But what about all the other things? If you want to talk about size class, just here in what's proposed, it's not consistent. There are two cars here that one's not included in that, but another one is. They need to get this shit together. I'm also, oh. we can <laughs> okay, bet that we can <laughs> I'm also really curious as to how it's going to be enforced because parking inspectors at the moment walk around with a piece of chalk or that's computer based, but they're not being asked to decide between what's heavier, right? They're not looking at a car and going, well, you should be paying this rate and you're not. Presumably, if they are going to actually put this into force properly, there needs to be some system which then taps into a registration database, works out what vehicle class it is, and then charges people appropriately for that. I don't live in Yarra Council. If I did, I don't know that I want my council spending money on some bespoke back-end system for a strange parking structure when that money could be better spent on all sorts of other things. So that is the other challenge with this. It's a very small area trying to implement quite a diff complex system that I can't imagine is going to be cheap. No. Yeah, it's, uh, and my biggest concern, and I, I said this to you uh, last week when we were talking about it before you went on the project. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I spoke yeah. about it. But, you know, what happens when there's some farmer who drives in in his Land Cruiser? Because that's the only car he has, because the world's best oncologist is in Yarra City Council and he has to pay more just for the privilege of going there so his health is up to date. Like it, it really, it doesn't seem thought through no. at all. It's, it's just ridiculous. Yeah. I think that's, it's like when certain councils in inner city Melbourne suddenly decide that 10 kilometre an hour pet speed limits are a good idea because someone <laughs> might run in front or in front of it. Yeah. If you're listing Collingwood. Yes. Yeah, well, you know, it's, it's just stupid things like this where people could be spending their, you know, valuable time doing something more Productive. Productive, exactly right. And the one thing, the one last thing I want to point out about it before we move <laughs> on, one of their claims is that these large vehicles produce 30% more emissions. Now, I don't know where that number's come from, but a lot of these large vehicles, like let's say the Kia EV9, produce a lot less emissions. Well, again, this is a, a definitions issue, right? Because utes do produce more emissions as a general rule than something like a RAV4 or, or a Yaris. Kashkai <laughs> or a Yaris. Yeah. So no issue with that. But 
these large vehicles is not a vehicle class. It's not the sort of data we can dig into and actually understand. It's just a broad sweeping statement with no backing. And I think that's more the issue here. It's not being clearly defined or laid out. It's just kind of buzzword based. And that's a real problem. Mm. Well, they certainly got the attention that they wanted or the, <laughs> yeah. the clicks or the social media engagement they were after. So um, well done, Green Senators. All right, let's move on. Uh, time to talk about something that's not very green, the Grand Prix. <laughs> it is Grand Prix week. So we're doing a special what would you this week, guys. Now I want to know, you're going to the Grand Prix, Sir Lewis rings you up and Sir says, Lewis. hey boys, I need a lift to the Grand Prix. What car are you taking? It doesn't have to be a Mercedes, it doesn't have to be a Ferrari, but there is no price limit. What sports car would you take to the Grand Prix this week? I'm going the new Aston Martin Vantage. Uh, I love the look Pick of it. Pick up Fernando, I guess. Pick up Fernando. <laughs> yes. uh, I love the look of it. It's got a Mercedes V8 in it, so it's still on brand for Lewis. Uh, I feel like it's the right way to make an entrance because it looks fantastic and it also has the sports car credentials for when I've dropped Lewis off and want to get the hell out of there. Or you can stay and be the safety car. I just <laughs> <the other> option. <laughs> give, uh, give car run to the keys for a little bit. Yeah, I'm sure he'd love that. What about you, James? I'd probably get, get also go Aston Martin, go for the DBS though. Oh. It's a bit bigger, a bit more brash and a bit more um, luxurious, I think. I mean, okay. So. At least you didn't say the DBX. I was worried when you said bigger for a second. No, 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 no. Like, yeah, it's more James Bond vibe, you know? Yeah, very James Bond vibe. All right, well, uh, if either of those cars are of interest to you, we've got a helpful uh, section on our website that can maybe get you one uh, sooner than you might think. I'm not sure what the delays are like on Aston Martin's Can at the I moment. actually say, we, we don't have necessarily lots of that Aston Martin connections, but Mazda, for example, yes. the MX-5, we have plenty of Mazda dealers on our books. That's true. Um, they used to do a great race. Mazda used to sponsor a great race at the Grand Prix. Yeah, it was Celebrity the Celebrity race. Challenge, exactly. Yeah. So... If you are looking at something more affordable, there are plenty of Mazda dealers, for yes. example, on there. <laughs> yes. um, there's so plenty of other options. Head to Google and type in Help Me Car Expert. It'll take you to a page on the site where we can help you find a new car. Uh, you can talk to a consultant who's based here in Australia so they'll know where you are when you say I'm from Timbuktu, South Australia. And they'll be able to connect you to a dealer who is uh, waiting to get you into a new car, uh, possibly sooner than you might think. So check it out, Google Help Me Car Expert. And if you do use the service, leave a comment, let us know how it was. Um, right. Fun little side note for you on that. We did actually recently get an inquiry from someone in Humpty Doo, which Humpty is a real Doo. place. Right, and the consultant, I'm sure, was able to help them. Absolutely. <laughs> Humpty Doo. So if you're from Humpty Doo, leave a comment and let us know. <laughs> uh, all right, uh, we're going to talk about uh, Nissan now. Um, Nissan have their own special take on hybrid technology. So uh, Toyota Hybrid, for instance, it uses an internal combustion engine, and there's a little battery that helps give assistance to drive the car. But Nissan have decided, we don't like that. We're going to do something completely different. Uh, and James, you've recently driven the Qashqai e-Power. So tell us a little bit about that. Uh, yes, so we maybe, I'll maybe start with the e-Power stuff first, just in case people don't really understand it. So an e-Power hybrid is a series hybrid technology as opposed to the series parallel stuff that some other brands do. So you've still got a petrol engine, you've got a, a small battery and an electric motor, but the petrol engine doesn't actually directly drive the wheels. The petrol engine is hooked up to an inverter which then sends power to the electric motor via you know, battery charge or you know, all that kind of stuff. And then it's actually an electric motor that drives the wheels exclusively. So they launched it, Nissan launched this technology ages ago in some of their Japanese domestic stuff. It launched last year with the X, larger X-Trail and X-Trail in Australia only has the dual motor system. So the Qashqai is coming in as front wheel drive only. It's our first time trying the single motor version. So it has uh, 140 kilowatts and 320 newton meters, which is pretty peppy for something that size. Well, it's only a small SUV, isn't it? Yeah, it's on the, somewhere in the in between, we sort of yeah, say. It's a small big or a big small, it's yeah, sort of yeah. halfway in between yeah. the two. Yeah, and um, you know, this car is incredibly popular in other parts of the world, and the e-power the e system gives it you know, almost Toyota hybrid levels of fuel consumption. But well, also, you tested it at 5.4 litres per 100, which yeah, is pretty dang it's, good. It's less than I what I get out of a RAV4. Oh, I dropped one off this morning and was sitting on 5.5 after a week of normal commuting driving. That's so good, similar yeah. to RAV4, num not quite Corolla cross numbers, but yeah. similar to RAV4 numbers. Yeah, and I think the other thing about ePower, one of the, um, at the X-Trail launch last year, one of their head engineers from their European office came down and explained it to us why they went with this sort of drivetrain concept. And part of the reason was is that when they sort of did some consumer insights, people really liked the performance of EVs, but because they're too expensive, they weren't necessarily going to buy one. So they sort of tried to give the drive experience of the EV with the fuel consumption of a hybrid so they can combine the two most desirable aspects of those powertrains and put it into one vehicle. And so this way you can drive an EV per se, but you also don't have, ever have to plug it in because you just fill it up like a normal car. 
So um, just to, to clarify a little bit, and maybe you can help me understand it, because I think it's quite cool, but I'm not sure I'm fully across it. So it has a 2.1 kilowatt hour battery, which yes. is not what you would see in an EV or even a plug-in hybrid. A plug-in hybrid would have a 15 we'll Call it 10 battery. to 20 kilowatt hour battery, sure. something like that. So, But it has a petrol motor at the front under the yeah. bonnet where you would expect it, but it doesn't actually drive the wheels, does it? Not directly, but it can operate in a couple of different ways. So the car can run on what they call pure EV, which is engine turned off battery driving wheels. It can run with the engine charging the battery and the battery feeding the wheels directly. And then it can also run in a third sort of mode where the engine doesn't bypass the battery but provides extra power through that inverter to the electric motor when you really want to accelerate hard. So it's interesting when you first drive it. Each hybrid system is a bit different. You drive a Toyota and you get this used to this sort of electric first 20 k's an hour than the engine kicking in. In the Nissan, when you accelerate hard, you hear the engine working like you would in a normal Toyota hybrid, call it. But there are also times where you'll be slowing down and the engine kicks in to start charging the battery. So even though you're braking, the engine is not accelerating, but it sort of feels like it's working against you even though it isn't. It does take some getting used to, but I found this Qashqai compared to the X-Trail was even more refined. The engine is really nice and quiet. It's really quiet. There's no vibrations through the steering wheel. And I actually really enjoy driving Toyota hybrids now. They're really smooth and clever in the city, but I feel like the consistency of what you get in the Nissan when you accelerate, it's always the same sort of smooth response. When you brake, it always works the same way without power sourcing sources cutting in and out. I think it's a little bit nicer, even if it isn't quite as efficient outright. So James, when you went on the launch um, for it, were you driving around town or did you go out in the countryside a little bit? We, we drove from like the Melbourne airport out to Hepburn Springs, which is sort of like out past like Bendi Ballarat Bendigo way. And um, so we had a mix of like in town stuff, a lot of country freeway and like B roads. So it was quite a, maybe perhaps not the best hybrid stomping grounds per se, but it also allowed us to really showcase the, the performance of what this drive chain can do and also the, the Qashqai's handling ab ability. So, you know, the whole point of it is it, it's meant to be fairly uncompromised compared to the standard petrol models. And really the only compromise, if you really had to list one, was that you don't get a, a spare wheel, you get a tire repair kit. But otherwise the, the cabin and the packaging is all exactly the same because the battery is um, packaged under the front seat so there's, oh, that's it's different. <laughs> yeah, so it's never actually impeding like the floor pan or the boot or anything like that. It actually quotes a higher boot figure because there's no spare wheel under the boot. Right. So, um, but yeah, in terms of how it drove, it's very smooth, very refined. Um, as Scott said, it's actually a little bit more refined than the X-Trail. It's got um, active sound cancellation, so it plays a, an alternative frequency through the sound system at speed so that you don't hear either you know, road and wind noise, but also the engine. And so it's very, very well suppressed to the point where sometimes you forget there's actually an engine in the front. And um, the other aspect to it is Nissan has calibrated the engine so that it will um, step its revs in a certain way to try and align itself with how you're accelerating. So if you, if you, if it turns on and you're going a certain speed or you've got a certain throttle input, it might rev at like 2000 RPM or 4000 RPM. And then when you're really gunning at it, it'll flare it a little bit higher to sound a little bit more natural. Yeah, not throw you off when you're braking, it's going well, <laughs> yeah, Genuinely, the first time I drove it in the X-Trail, it didn't bang off the rev limit, but I was slowing down and the engine kicked in and it just kicked in in a way that made me feel like the car was going to accelerate. Mm. And again, there was nothing dangerous about it. it. You get used to it very quickly, but I had this moment of which pedal am I pressing? because you are so attuned to listening to a car to understand what's going on with it. That adjustment period is short, but it is there definitely with this system as there is with any new tech. Well, it is, it is new technology. Um, I guess it's been tested for a little while in the x trial now, and now it's here in Qashqai. But if uh, your money on the table, would you be going the hybrid, uh, or the, sorry, the e-power Qashqai, or would you just go with the standard petrol? I would be going the e-power. Um, I have just driven the top spec car like James, and I really enjoyed it. I think it's a really polished little SUV. The petrol car is still good, but that drivetrain, it's a turbocharged CVT, and it can feel a little bit jerky at times. So yeah, for me, that e-power is a really lovely thing, and that's what I'd be having. What about you, James? I think that e-power is the best cash card that they make, and the, re the only real issue with it is the fact that it's four grand more than the equivalent petrol one. And it's only top spec at the moment as well. Yeah, so they originally were gonna launch with uh, two variants, with a mid, mid spec and a top spec, and they decided not to because there was overwhelming interest for the top of the range one. Typical Australians yep. just want the best of everything. Yep. <laughs> so um, it just means the price of entry is a little bit high. So in terms of what its consideration set is, you're looking at like top spec everything else, whereas when you're looking at like a Corolla Cross, you can get a hybrid for much cheaper. So that's really the only issue that I 
have with it. Otherwise, I think that it's a really, it's the best Qashqai in terms of performance, refinement. It's the most efficient as well. It's much cheaper to service over five years than the, the petrol one is. And you know, you've got a really solid product that in terms of sizing is in a great space where it can fit a family, but also is not too big for the city. And you know, the, you know, being able to do five to five and a half liters per hundred k's and get 800 to 900 k's out of a tank, you know, what's not what's not so yeah. well. Hopefully, it'll pay for itself within a couple of years. Uh, okay, uh, picks of the week, guys. Uh, it's time. They don't have to be Grand Prix related. It's okay. I'll let that go. But James, I'll go to you first. What is your pick this week? Okay, so the level of budget is kind of the same as F1, okay. but it's not F1 related. <laughs> um, I found this really cool video on Instagram that someone had gone into the most exclusive ski resort in like the Swiss Alps or something and was just recording all the different cars that were coming in. And when I'm telling you, I was watching about $50 million worth of rentals <laughs> in the space of 30 seconds, and they all just park up like it's nothing, and then they probably go to their chalets or their private you know, rental homes or whatever. And it was Supercars just, of the Swiss Alps. Yeah, yeah, it was very cool. Yeah. Yeah. What about you, Scott? What's your pick this week? I've gone a little bit different. It is F1 related. Uh, it's someone called, I think her name's Almost Cheska. German Instagrammer who puts together these really chaotic F1 race wraps. I don't know if I like them or I hate them because it's a bit sort of stuttery and a bit out there, but very, um, very different way of going through what happened in the race. And I think as F1 evolves to get more people in, the more voices and the more people we have talking about, it's a good thing. Uh, well, mine this week is a bit of a shameless plug for ourselves. So um, recently, Tony and Albor sat down with uh, the guys from Collecting Cut collecting cars, I know I'll get there in the end, uh, including Chris Harris. and The uh, Chris Harris. The Chris Harris. If you're a fan of Top Gear, uh, you would know Chris Harris. Don't tell Ed Lovett short. He's the <laughs> other guy in that chat. <laughs> yes. uh, but, but Chris actually had a, quite some interesting things to say about Aussie car culture. So we're going to play a clip of that now. Aussie car culture has always been something I just love. I, I love I loved Holden. I love Ford. I love V8s. I went to Bathurst 10 years ago to watch, to watch the big race. Yeah. And I, you know, just... From everything from the, it had the highest quality racing, the highest quality bad behavior. It had everything. It was for me. For I think me, it's the only race in the world where you're only allowed a certain number of beer bottles to bring in. Yeah. No other part in the world has that sort of restriction, but people come and bury it in the yeah, sand. Yeah. Two cases yeah. only, yeah. yeah. I, mean, I don't even know how you yeah. go through that in 12 hours, but yeah. they do. Are you guys going to come on Sunday? Yes, I am. Yeah. He'll be back in Brisbane, but um, that is one of the most underrated tracks of all time. And once you get once you get into that awful bloody vortex of watching one off qualifying laps of Brocky back in the day and you know just just firing this thing at walls. Frightening. Yeah. And the and the total lack of suspension control. It's like they're talking about he's got this new setup. He's got no setup. No. <laughs> he's just steering it with his gonads. Yeah. He's just hanging it totally, out. Totally, totally. And, and then Tom Walkinshaw in the V12 Jags. All, it's fantastic spectacle. Yeah, yeah. And the commentary, of course, you know, you're the greatest commentators in the world. Some yeah. of the words, oh, man, it's just screaming, screaming. You know, I, yeah, I, I think there's motoring culture here. Hooning, I think it's fantastic. We, uh, we walked in through the underground garage and there was a Maloo. I can't, I've got, I can't not take photographs of them. So yeah, uh, Chris likes Maloos. Um, <laughs> I like Chris a little bit more now, <laughs> not gonna lie. We have that full interview coming out on our YouTube channel on Thursday, so make sure you subscribe for that. We're also gonna run it uh, on, our, on the audio platform, so if you're listening to it, uh, you'll be able to listen to the full interview as well. Um, it goes to about 45 minutes, pretty, pretty cool chat. They talk about what's going on with collecting cars, how they're coming to Australia, and I guess a whole bunch of uh, interesting and different components. Don't give it all away. No, 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 Let's I'm make not. people go and watch. Come <laughs> yeah, on, it's a good watch. Yes. So just send them over there. And yes, yeah, so Thursday that will be live, so make sure you are subscribed for that. Um, guys, that pretty much brings us to the end this week. Any final thoughts before we wrap it up? Just excited for the Grand Prix. I know I was last week as well. I'm more but, excited this yeah, week. Yeah, exactly, we're closer. <laughs> yes, I'm hoping that uh, Daniel Ricciardo is floating around here somewhere near our office, maybe. You never know. There is a, a Cam Waters Mustang parked down outside the Woolworths, so you never know. I don't know that Danny Rick's all that keen on a monster Mustang, given he works for Red Bull. Yeah, but Ford. True. That's true. All right, there you go. Never mind. So tune in next week. We'll let you know if we found Daniel Ricciardo. But boys, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, all of you, for uh, joining us this week. And uh, enjoy the race on Sunday. Enjoy the fine weather that we have this week. And we'll see you all next week.